uh, heritage skills in context. But what I wanted to do, to do was sort of pick up the theme of the conference, which is in archaeology in context, and give you a couple of thoughts on how the skills that we develop as uh, information managers in our sector are also of relevance to the wider society. So here we are. Uh, archaeology as a discipline uh, doesn't exist in isolation. Uh, we have close connections to different other domains, such as uh, government, uh, commercial, um, charity, etc., all of which are part of a, a larger society. So that's really what I want to, to, to get across first. And looking ahead, things are quite rosy for those with information management skills. <laughs> this is a survey of um, the future workforce, and sectors in the top right hand corner are going to grow and get more valuable. So Information technology and construction, good. You know, if you're in that area, you will have a job in 10 years' time. Manufacturing, not so good. But it's not all rosy. Uh, digital skills are great, but not everyone can make use of them. Uh, this is a survey of digital exclusion in the country, which combines the very purpose of people's skills, uh, the quality of their broadband, and the amount of time they actually spend online. And it's found that a quarter of the population, almost, don't possess basic digital skills. So think how that excludes them from services, from online. And if we put everything that we do online, how is that going to reach one quarter of the population? And it's not just uh, a problem for us as individuals. Uh, uh, over a million uh, small and medium enterprises, uh, which includes most archaeological organisations in, in, in this definition, don't have basic digital skills available to them. And also, uh, slightly more than half of the charitable sector. Uh, what this means is that uh, charities and uh, these small companies uh, may not be able to make use of the services uh, which uh, are only available digitally. And there is an increasing push, a commercial pressure, money saving pressure to make things available online only. So, what does this survey mean about? what basic digital skills are. Well, here are some of the headings. Um, communicating, problem solving, transacting, and creating uh, material online or using digital content. But for our point of, from our purpose, uh, it extends slightly beyond uh, that to also include managing information, by which they mean find, manage, and store uh, information and content. Uh, and just to dig a little bit deeper, so you'll see how uh, what that means in practice, I think there's the, the next couple of slides will just uh, identify what uh, this definition means. So for organisations, uh, this means being able to do things like store information on suppliers and customers, discover potential opportunities to grow your business, um, search for new suppliers and so on, and understand your website when and how well it works. Uh, and there's things that we can do to address this. The, the sub survey that did the basic the digital skills survey has set up this thing called the Digital Skills Charter, uh, which uh, has got a two million pound uh, lottery fund grant to try and provide these skills to a greater proportion uh, of, the, of the population, particularly in those areas uh, where we sort of were excluded. So this is something good that we could do with our information management skills. We're archaeologists first, but we also have skills which are useful to society. And this is the point I wanted to make, that colleagues should all have basic digital skills, the customers need them, and the community, people without basic digital skills shouldn't be left behind. And talking about personal journeys, uh, by participation in this group, the Information Management Special Interest Group, I gained the skills to design and build a website for a charity that I work for. Uh, I've recently, uh, combined Twitter and the website, and also made a, an online uh, map of um, where the charity serves. <laughs> Looking at, uh, this isn't a, a problem just for us, a uh, group called Tech Partnership, which is like the Heritage Alliance for the Digital Economy, is looking at digital analyst apprenticeships. Uh, these are ways of looking at how those skills could be recognised. In our own sector, we have uh, the National Occupational Standards that he referred to, this web address where they were available for you. And we'll have a bit more look at these in detail um, after, after the presentation. But basically, they define what skills mean for, for the digital purpose. 
And of course, we're not the only people with information management problems. Uh, this is just a search on the, that website uh, to find all of those occupations which have a, you know, information management in the, uh, in the content of the National Occupational Standards. I was hoping there might be brewers in here to get the compulsory beer reference in, but I couldn't find it. So, I mean, our, if we can define the skills that we want, you know, looking at this uh, here, that's going to benefit us as individuals in terms of our career development, our organisation in terms of how they recruit and manage us, what we can do as a sector and also benefit society. So here's an example of how you might use the National Occupational Standards for planning a piece of your own CPD. Define what it is what you want to do, use the standards to define what that actually means in practice and how you can demonstrate it, and then you evaluate your performance uh, at the end of it. So there's lots of things you can do with those standards. It's not just about qualifications. So what is uh, IMSIG doing about this? Well, the first thing is we've created what uh, we call a competency matrix uh, covering these sort of skills, and this will help validation committee to look at applications for membership from people who may only have a, a, an information management background. Uh, so the takeaways here are you should be valuing your information management skills, and we want you to use this session to help support IMSIC in getting those skills recognised. Thank you. So um, now for something completely different. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I mean, I wanted to take the approach of just sort of discussing how it is that I came to be um, where I am, whether that's of value to anyone or not. I'm just for you to determine, really. Um, but um, I've been in, in my I've been in working in the UK for the last 15 years and in pretty steady employment, and I do sometimes wonder how exactly I got myself here. Um, but I did an undergraduate degree in classical archaeology in the US. And then I, um, I worked and I, I waited tables, I did a lot of variety, a huge variety of different things before, um, over a very short period of time really, including excavating and working in field archaeology. And, um, and but one of the reasons I wanted to include this slide is actually because one of the skills that I acquired was selling food um, and waiting tables in the US. And when you wait tables in the US, you are genuinely selling food. Your tips rely on your ability to sell food. And, and so, yeah, it can go a bit over the top. I never did that, thankfully. But um, it is about selling yourself. And um, so I, I, I then um, acquired, I did a, um, after my undergraduate degree in working in field archaeology a bit, I thought, well, I can either do geology and something with that, or I can do GIS. So I did a module of each, and I really didn't like the geology, but the GIS was really agreeing with me. And so that was kind of a really deciding point for me, at which point I decided to do a master's degree in York. And then that led to a job in Glasgow, which has led me long way around to Fort Cumberland where I work now as an archaeological information systems manager for the excavation and analysis team down in Fort Cumberland. And um, that job really does involve, as I said earlier, doing a lot of the translation work and, and liaising work between the teams and the IT and it's, it's, it's sometimes not nearly as exciting as it would seem to be but um, I think the, the takeaway for me is that it, it may not always be that exciting but I still really enjoy the pieces of data that I get to work with and the people I get to work with. And that's really what makes it for me. I could be, I mean, it, you know, some of these skills would be very transferable to other things, but um, sometimes it is about just answering people's questions as well. And some of the really mundane things that comes up because we have a variety of specialists down in the fort and have a variety of different expertise, many of which are not IT. And IT is still something that they're transitioning into in many ways. But I think that is definitely something that's changing. So I want to talk about, um, one of the things I want to talk about is dangerous toys, because I think there's a real temptation within um, digital archaeology to find your way towards those things that um, look the flashiest, the newest, and the most interesting. And in reality, unless you can bring the added value to demonstrate how they are going to be uniquely valuable to your career, you may be just playing around, if I'm going to be blunt about it. And I've included the uh, hype cycle, thanks to the reminder from Ed yesterday. And I mean, I think this is a really good thing to keep in mind, that, that as technologists, we are really acutely aware of all the technology that's around and, and keen to use it and make the most of it. But we do have to have that, we have to have that demonstrable value of what we're doing. And I'm not saying that these approaches aren't necessarily useful. I'm saying you need to make sure that what you're doing with them is useful and going to build on to something more valuable. Because 
You could be doing all the point clouds in the world or flying drones over any number of different sites, but unless you are really sticking to archaeological questions that, that really are being addressed by these techniques, you are at risk of simply creating a vast amount of data that you then should really be archiving and looking after. And weirdly enough, that's probably where you're going to get most of the skills that people will employ you to do. Um, and I've included this slide because I think it's really worth remembering that um, we are archaeologists, and and if you get too caught up, I've actually had feedback from an em someone who hired me that the fact that I couldn't code was a reason they employed me because coding takes you out of the field. <laughs> I've included this slide now because um, it's I think it's really important that people are asking really pragmatic, serious, applicable questions when it comes to doing re research and PhDs, and that that it's really quite a difficult area to to go into archaeology. Think you'll get a PhD and you'll get an academic job. Well, you won't have to die of cancer. So here's what I did. Um, I looked in 2001 at the gaps, and I said, where are they? And really where they were, where there were a lot of archaeologists that were not doing digital stuff. That's not the case anymore, but it was certainly the case then. So it was a, a hell of a lot easier for me, if I'm going to be honest. Doing GIS, doing database and web design, that was, that was it. That's all you needed to do. And that interested me, because you can find the things, you can find those gaps, but if they're not interesting to you, move on. Really don't waste your time on the things you don't want to do, because it's a profession that is about the passion for it and the love for the archaeology. And, and um, it doesn't always have to be interesting, but at least be able to fall back on the parts of it that are interesting to you. And back to this other really critical point, it is about the archaeology. And it has to come back to this. We, we are technologists, but only after we are archaeologists. And you know, with all of the options and the plethora of, of ways of approaching things, these are just tools like the trial. And um, so what are the skills? I mentioned earlier things like GIS, databases, web design. I've developed a bit in social media and doing a bit with that as well. And, um, and I think that, um, but there are also things like management, <laughs> line management, um, perf you know, performance management, project designs, developing all of these other things that, that you need to be able to go forward with. And um, how do I demonstrate them? Well, I mean, we've discussed some of them, but for me mostly it's been presenting papers, publishing, writing a bit of guidance for my colleagues, and, and you know, it hasn't really been the formal CPD route yet. I've been really lazy about that, so it's something I need to do. And then this is my um, slide that I included because I really needed to get to 20. And, uh, but it is a really good point, which is that um, you know, we don't always need bigger computers. Sometimes we just need to be asking better questions. And, um, and you know, it's not always about bigger, faster, more. Um, it's like, you know, Moore's Law is almost as much about our own will to proceed as it is about the technology. And um, this is my final slide, which is the disclaimer that this is my path. It doesn't necessarily need to be anyone else's, and it's also now 15 years on. So there is that caveat that things change and they move on, and, and you know, you will have to make your own path. But, it, you know, it, it, I think that there are ways to go. So. That's me, yeah. <laughs> right, I'm going to struggle to say things I think that haven't already been said by Ed and Hugh or in our discussion. I'm not going to be as informative as Ed or as lighthearted and humorous as Hugh. So um, hopefully we'll put up it's a very personal uh, journey because it all started with a bit of a realization for me that I've been working in information management and managing IT for 20 years. I guess, yes, I have had a career that long. And my only qualification was a degree in archaeological sciences, which did have an IT uh, course as part of it. So where am I? Where's my career? Well, I'm a heritage professional. I'm also an information manager. And I've done quite a lot of IT. So in that Venn diagram, I sort of sit somewhere in the, in the middle, in a strange, <laughs> in, a, in a strange world. Um, and uh, there are others out there who are relevant to this. Obviously, I, CIFA is very relevant because I'm an archaeologist, but there's also the Charlton Institute of Library and Information Professionals, BCS, the Charlton Institute for IT, and uh, the Archives and Records Management Association. Um, I've joined SILIP. And SILIC isn't just about libraries. Everybody says, oh, that's the library people, isn't it? And uh, equally, it's not just about 
Librarians. Although I'm getting ahead of my slides. I told you I hadn't practiced the timings on this. Yes, it's not about that. It's not about librarians either. Um, these are photographs from our archive. The last one, by the way, was a, a prison library, which is what conference often feels a bit like for a few days. Stuck in a bubble. <laughs> yeah, so we're stuck in, and in this room we're stuck in a knowledge bubble at the moment. So, I progressed a route for chartership through SILIP. In SILIP, all full members and fellows are chartered. To gain chartership, you first have to join as an associate, register for, and be accepted onto the chartership program. Then there's the funding. Firstly, you have to find a mentor to work with. And when you've done that, you sign up to a learning agreement between the two of you. And you fill out a little learning plan to fill the gaps in your knowledge to make you a sort of well-rounded professional. Not for the whole of everything that SILIP covers. I don't need to know about how to run a public library, for example. But I mean, I'm still an archaeologist, not a librarian. And even though, as you can see, LinkedIn keeps um, telling me the latest library stories now, ever since I joined SILIP on LinkedIn, uh, may, well, it's possibly because my profile photograph has me standing in front of a bookcase. And having a mentor is great. It, it really is. Honest. I, I very much enjoyed working with my mentor. She was brilliant. And at times it was actually quite cathartic because I used to get a moan to her about things at work. Because it was also about the soft skills. It wasn't just about the IT and information management skills. Then you come to the scary bit when your mentor says to you, don't you think you've done enough learning about stuff? Write up your portfolio, submit your work, wait, get it obsessed. And then you get to put MCLIP after your name. And I did, because I passed. I'm very proud of that. I mean, it was actually the best CPD I think I've ever done studying for my chartership. And you've got access to lots of online resources. There's a virtual learning environment at CILIP where you're also supposed to log your CPD. Notice that, I say supposed to, mine's a bit behind, and I need to actually have a good session filling it in. And that also has access to something that's sort of been out called the professional knowledge and skills base. BCS is very different. Um, not all full members of BCS are chartered. I'm a member, but I'm not chartered. You have to be a full member to go for chartership to add an extra CITP, Chartered IT Professional. Um, and that includes an exam, again like SILIP, an assessment of portfolio, and then an interview, which apparently is m normally done over the phone rather than sitting in front of a row of desks with people. So it's a slightly different route to becoming a chartered member. Where next? Well, that's now three different CPD logs for different organisations I have to keep up. Fortunately, I just use the same, I do try and use the same one. And I think in order to realise that we have transferable skills as information professionals and IT professionals that are different from just being an archaeologist. So just being an archaeologist, we're all proud to be archaeologists. And you can train as a mentor yourself. I've now been on the mentor training course for SILIP. Unfortunately, nobody wants me to have me as their mentor and I don't have any students yet. Hopefully that's just because they want to go for people with a proven track record of getting people through chartership. Oh, a little bit of other bits of personal advice. I, I use social media for CPD. I love it. But when I was studying for my chartership, the regular um, organised conversations on Twitter were brilliant between candidates. And uh, you can learn so much from others in working in information in other sectors. So don't tie yourself down to one area. I think we should all aspire to be polymaths, even though I'm not really sure anybody has ever become a true polymath. And all sectors of information need IT professionals. So there's the same with this Venn diagram, but I've just replaced heritage with a question mark because I think you can pick anything in there. You should try something new, even a presentation like this, <laughs> which I'm still calling Pikachu because I can't pronounce Petcha Kircha. <laughs> 20 slides is an awful lot in under seven minutes. But you know, you should be breaking, you should be pushing your comfort zones a bit. And I think that's my 20th slide, it's telling me to stop. Thanks.